to the Essence of Tea podcast. My name is Jenny Zia. I'm your host, and I am so excited to introduce to you today Sodhir Prakash from India, and he is a very, very special soul, a friend that I had made a couple years ago when we were visiting India and his TSA in Assam. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. So as you I, say, namaste. <laughs> namaste, Jenny. Namaste. So I'm curious to know, I know your family has been in the tea industry a while. Would you like to share about how you, your, you and your family got into tea, a little of the history of your family's tea journey? Well, uh, it started in uh, our hometown of 100 years in the foothills of Himalaya in Masuri. It's, no, it's a town north of Delhi of 200 miles. It was one of the first areas that the British planted their tea. And my grandfather was a tea shop owner and he used to grow tea and he, he used to sell tea and he wanted to grow it also. And he got some land from the local ruler and he grew which is already growing tea actually, and he cultivated it. And in this is in 1900s about, he cultivated it for 30 years. And then the, it was a lease land. It was not sold to him, it was lease land, the lease land out. So he went, he was wondering what to do. He went all the way from Dehradun to Assam, which is more, almost 1500 miles away and bought a small garden from the British. And from then on, that was in 1939, the family went on buying gardens. We were, my grandfather were two brothers and between them, they had eight sons. And each time a son graduated, he was sent, a garden was bought for him to manage. Wow. So the family, family went on growing till in the sixties, we had about 20 estates all over India. But as happens with eight people trying to work together, they could not. So in the 60s, they all split and each one got one or two gardens. My father got Khongyati estate where I am just now. And I bought a garden in Darjeeling, Glenburn. I also bought a garden in South India called Hiliburiati estate. And but of course, before this partition, I was a young man. I had the privilege of working in all areas of India on the tea growing. So I'm familiar with any kind of region that you wish to talk about. It isn't just East India or North India or South India. You can ask me a question of anywhere in India and I should be able to technically answer your questions. Oh, wow. That's that's amazing. Well, I might have to ask you some questions. Well, depending on because we're we're starting to grow tea in Alaska. So I have so many different varietals from different types of regions because we're experimenting with it. So. Well, it's it's um, the first criteria you need because the tea grows only if there are certain number of sunlight hours in a day. It's not worried about the winter and the cold or too, too cold is not good. So unless you are able to substitute the sun with solar lamps or something, which give you the same wavelengths that the sun gives, I don't think you'll be successful. I'm sorry to say. If you are successful, you will have made history. Okay. We'll have to learn something. Yeah, we'll have to learn something if you can grow, grow this. You do have long sunlight hours in Alaska. Maybe you have got 16 hours of sunlight, but that's only for a few months. So you would only grow the tea for those few months, but that's not enough for the tea to flourish. Yes, so it, yeah, I, we, so we do it, have some supplemental sunlight um, that, that we're using also for the other plants in the greenhouse, so. Yeah, well, we can talk about that later. So that's amazing that you got into tea, well, essentially your whole family and generations. And I know that we had um, toured TRA, which is a Tea Research Association of India. And you used to be the former chairman of, of um, is it Toklai? Yes, that's right. Very good. 
And so um, can you explain to people around the world who might be listening in what Toklai is? Um, I mean, it's a very, very fascinating place. We saw very, uh, just a small amount of the facilities and we could have spent days visiting there. We were for, um, fortunate enough at the time when I came to visit that we also met the um, the president of the, the tea um board of india too so at tokla what do you what do you do there or what happens there if people have no idea what research on tea in india is like yeah that's a good question first let me tell you the background of toklai toklai was actually founded in cambridge when the british were the persons who founded the tea industry in india they set up a scientific community in cambridge uk to do experiments and research on tea. This was called the London Research Center, which was when the British left, it was shifted to India and it came under the Association of Indian Tea Association as a branch. But basically it was founded in Toklai. So basically what we see at Toklai is the, is the successor of the English society. And I think that society still exists in England but in a very uh, fragmentary and small way. So this Toklai over the years has been built up into a scientific institute for tea. The distinguishing factor between this institute and other of tea might be that the research that is done there is called applied research. We are not in Toklai trying to find out fundamental research because that requires a lot of money, a lot of capital, very sophisticated instruments, and it is difficult to do. And it's no use to the tea industry unless it is of use to the tea industry. Tea industry is not wanting to do research just to get a Nobel Prize. So all the research is focused on how to improve tea. Now, if you give me one minute, I just got a list of projects that are there just now. Hold on. I didn't know that you'd want so much detail, but still, it's a pleasure to tell you. Okay, now here, here it goes. Now, for instance, there is a project on, oh, dear me. One minute, please. Okay, now, for instance, there's understanding the mechanism of resistance of sucking pests and development of a micro based on bioinformation. Number two, <laughs> this is under the head entomology. There are four, five departments. One is entomology, which studies how pests and diseases can be rid of. And increasingly, we have to also be sure about uh, the residual levels of pesticides, because increasingly the pesticides and weedicides, etc., they leave they leave toxicity on the plants, which is not which leaves which is done with the tea. So while while I say this, I'm just deviating a little bit on organic tea, because I stopped started on this project this this matter of entomology. You see. I have not understood with all my scientific background, which is, I must confess that of a layman, I'm not a great scientist. There are only two areas from which a tea bush can take inputs. One is from the soil as fertilizers, and one is from the foliage as sunlight and rain. These are the only two areas that it creates. Now, the soil, whether where the roots are, Whatever be the fertilizer you put into the soil, if it's organic or inorganic, it is going to be metabolized and the plant is going to take only the nutrition, nitrogen. 
For instance, if Jenny is a vegetarian and I'm a non-vegetarian, and we both need protein, she will eat only cottage cheese, and I will I can eat fish. It doesn't <laughs> matter; the protein is the same. So it makes no difference whether you would fertilize her organic, or what you put in the soil. This whole thing about it being organic doesn't add or detract anything from the bush. The second point is from the foliage. Yes, if you are spraying pesticides, and that's how I came to this point just now, if you are spraying pesticides or anything on the leaves, it will, uh, the, 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 the pesticide will kill the bugs or mites, but they will remain on the bush as a residue. And this residue goes into your cup. It doesn't go into your cup, it goes into your tea, right? And it can be harmful to the human being. And so the organic way is not to use pesticides, but to use organic methods of controlling pests and diseases. Now that's very well, but still there, there's an element of myth in it because when this concern was raised, particularly by the Germans and the Europeans, but of course they're much more finicky than Americans are. <laughs> they, they, the, they wanted this residue to be reduced. And so we came across a word, a term that's called minimum residue level. If the residue level of any pesticide falls below a certain parts per million, million ppm, right? Then it is no longer harmful because it becomes too, too little, right? Yeah. So standards have been set. If you are into drinking tea, even if it's inorganic, but it satisfies the MRL levels, and these MRL levels can be tested in the lab. They're not something that someone is just saying that my tea is good. You can test it in the lab. If it is tested in the lab, passes the test, then there's no difference between organic and inorganic, except for money in the marketing, because they get more money for something. So I just caution you that organic tea may be very nice for saying that it's going so naturally, but actually as far as the benefit is concerned, there's no more health benefit in the organic tea than the inorganic tea. So I so, do have a question about that then. So the minimum mm, residue level for pesticides. Yes. So uh, yes. are, is that what determines whether it's going to be an organic or inorganic pesticide or is there a minimum requirement like you cannot use big, a higher than big, that big, as i said this is a marketing tool so a person who's making organic tea the, the people who started the organic tea movement insisted that organic things cannot be used and organic things cannot be used not even a little bit can be used even it makes no sense because otherwise, how do they able to market the tea? You see, so we are talking about certified from the from the scientific point of view, from the health point of view. If the MRL goes below a certain level, then you are safe. That it's been determined by human tests. It's been done done drug. It's been a lot of research has been done, and then only decided. So, what your question is? Yes, if you don't use, if you if you go below the minimum level, it's healthy but it's not organic. For organic, you mustn't use it. So do they allow past uh, the minimum residue or is there a, re for, for India, is there a level that it has to be below to use on tea plants, whether it's organic or the, uh, you You're saying, what is the minimum residue level? How is no, it set? Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is like, are is there, pesticides that people are not allowed to use because they're yes, over yes. the minimum. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's certainly pesticides that do not do not leave the toxicity and they are whatever it is that that pesticide is harmful and you cannot reduce it below the residue level. That for that is residue level is for each pesticide is different. Right? Yeah. And, and I may add one other thing. These MRLs are tested on dry tea. Whereas the tea that you drink is in liquid form. So it is further, even whatever residue is there on the tea is not there so much in the residue, in the liquid tea. So I mean, they may still be there. I'm not saying don't drink it, but I'm saying not only are your, the safety levels much above what is actually safe, 
but they are there to keep you happy, I mean, safe. Have you understood what I'm saying? The safety levels of MRL are much higher than what is required to be safe. Because the tea is not done, is not is tested, the MRL is tested on the dry tea, it is not being tested on the liquid tea. And the liquid tea, anything that doesn't dissolve in anything goes out. It's only those few chemicals that do not dissolve in the, in the water that would be there. So this is the fundamentals of the thing, but the, the, the peak market won't earn money if they don't, cannot sell that tea. You will see that organic tea sells for the higher rate. It's just a myth, but they sell at a higher rate. So do you find that there are different regions in India that will require more pesticides than others for those who haven't been there before? Because it's a very different yes, country. Yes, not only in India, I'm almost sure that the tea that you grow in Alaska will require very little pesticide. The pest will freeze. Oh, yes. <laughs> the pest will freeze. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The pest will freeze. <laughs> That's why we actually have um, easier export of potatoes outside of our country if they're grown in Alaska and other um, agricultural products. Because, yes, you're right. It's a pest will freeze. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's true. What but other... I want to just, I would just like to say, I'm not detracting from organic teas. It's good, right? For instance, it's better agriculture not to use chemicals, not to use fertilizers, but to rely on the way of nature. But it isn't necessary. It doesn't mean it does not translate to a better product for which you have to pay more. That's true. And and when I was visiting your um, gardens in Kongia, uh, it was very interesting. Besides me falling into a drainage ditch, that was funny. <laughs> um, but besides that, I was looking at the soil, and you were teaching us about you know things that you would not realize, like if the soil wants to hold in a lot of moisture or if it's going to have a lot of raining, you have to worry about mold and things like that. And I thought yeah. that was very fascinating, the research that um, TRA has done on that. Yes, Jenny, I, I could tell you now, we just touched upon one department that was entomology. Another important department is the soil department. And soil is the base of all crops. And what has happened to tea is that when it was first planted, it had a life, the bush had a life of about 60 years of viable production. Then it was uprooted and then a fresh bush was planted, which again grew for 60 years or so. Each time you uprooted the bush, you try to replenish the nitrogen and various other nutrients in the soil, but it never was the same as the original. And now we are reaching a time when that the bushes that were planted, replanted once after 60 years are reaching a time when they're going to be replanted after another 60 years and the soil is becoming spent. So, yeah. to, right? so to restore the health of the soil, so many experiments are done. We know that one of the important requirements are bacterias, the various bacterias that permit various nutrients to be dissolved and the plant can take it up. So the, the basic nutrients that we have in the soil are NPK, that is nitrogen, which is put in terms of urea, or P as in potash in terms of nutrient of potash, and sorry, K is nutrient of potash and P is phosphate. These are the three basic elements for NPK. And the problem with organic is, um, please don't take me long, but I must tell you all about it. The problem with organic is that organically, there is very little source of potash. You don't get potash organically. The other two nutrients you get by making compost, but you don't. This is a problem, how to solve it. So actually the tea planter would like to go organic, but he can't go completely organic because of these limitations. And that's why he is where he is. I mean, it's not an easy job. So soil, as you said, then soil, we also have with that water management because tea cannot, tea roots cannot grow in soil 
that has a water table that is three feet or less above the or below the ground level means the roots of the tea grow go down up to three feet so if the water remains below three feet it doesn't matter but anything above the three feet the the tea wants water that is basic requirement but it, the water must move it mm. cannot have stagnant water so what is very necessary in water management is to see that where it doesn't it does not matter in hills or terrain which is hilly because the water flows in any case but in places like dwarves or like in assam the water does not flow and so you have to make you have to make drains and those are very important so that's second thing and we also the climate is changing yes. so you have got a department of climate change we have seen at Tokrai that over 100 years the temperature has gone up by about one to two degrees now this may seem insignificant to a layman but for a plant it makes a very big difference and so climate change, uh, the increasing amount of carbon so in, the, in the atmosphere, these are long-term experiments that we're doing. The third area after, after entomology and soil management and your water management would be plant breeding. Now, this is where it started off actually, because when Tokolai started, all the natural things were in place in any case. They didn't have to do research on it but plant breeding was very important. Now there are two basic fundamental plants, plants that are there in tea or two different varieties. One is the Chinese bush, which is called the Chinese synthesis, uh, Camellia synthesis, and the other is the Assamica synthesis. They are two different varieties. Their genetic makeup is maybe very similar, but they do have different characteristics. And the China was founded, was found in China and the Assam, no one knows actually whether it came also from Assam. I don't want to go into any controversy about it, <laughs> but it is definitely grows in the climate of Assam. It flourishes in Assam, it's a broad leaf bush and the, uh, the, and the liquor is very strong, its characteristics make, makes very good CTCT, <laughs> right. And the Chinese bush is like a small little leaf, like the eyebrows of a Japanese doll, right? Very small. They very slender. Make very, yes, very slender, like you, madam. And, <laughs> and they uh, make very good Chinese tea, the green tea that you have. And they make very good long leaf tea, which you have. And so Chinese tea is grown in China, in, in, apart from China, of course, in a small way in Darjeeling. And that's, that is called the Chinese tea or the Chinese bush. Now, from these tea bushes, a lot of scientists have done breeding. It means you take one bush from China and one bush from Assam and you crossbreed them. How they did it was originally you you plant them, say, in a, in a nursery of four feet by four feet, and every alternate row, you put a different bush. So when the bushes grow, and the tea is not a bush, it's a tree. When it grows up to its tree height, then it flowers. And then like all other flowers, they pollinate. And they cross-pollinate, and you get a different breed, a different makeup. So this brings me to another point of uh, interest that the breeding, plant physiology and breeding is another department. In Tokrai, we have bred maybe 39. You see, you breed a plant for various characteristics. For instance, you want someone in, in, in a droughty area, you want a drought resistant plant. Or if you want someone growing someone for Alaska, you want a plant that doesn't want too long hours of sunlight, right? So you breed for that. You find out, and this is all done now by what is called molecular analysis. You you do the gen is biotechnology is the way out of breeding today. What was done by I described as being done in the in the in the nurseries is now being done in the laboratories, right? That so the a way lot of out time and years. <laughs> anything good takes time and years, my dear. If you want to do anything good, even the, even the tea plant takes seven years from the time it is sown to the time it starts giving you leaves that you can use. So 
time is certainly if you are if you are a person who believes in the philosophy of higher and fire and bang bang then tea is not for you <laughs> it's true we take time for tea it's true <laughs> correct. correct correct so that's it so that's another department of talk by most modern one biotechnology and physiology which is what is being done there's a, a third way in which breeding is to be done that is called tissue culture now i know tissue culture is very prominent in in the american subcontinent in, in agriculture or many many all over the world but the reason why it's not really useful in tea is for one simple reason that when you put take a tissue culture and replicate it you replicate it 100 percent it's almost exactly the same with the parent that you started with and you have made some mistake about some weakness in that cell that you replicated then it will be there in all the cells all the bushes will have the same weakness on the same strength and you're not going to realize it because you have to take seven years before it grows so you cannot take seven years and then decide you made a mistake and then uproot it it's not possible you can do that with tomatoes if one year you place some tomatoes which are not not properly bred not there the tissue culture for those tomatoes has not been done well thoroughly at the end of the year you can throw away those tomatoes and start with another breed of tomatoes right but yeah, this can't they, be done with tea. so you're talking right? about clonals clonals is halfway house okay. between the seeds which come from a nursery by cross-pollination and the molecular with uh, by the by the uh, tissue culture which is come by just replicating a tissue a cloner is halfway you take two two bushes and you take the the stem and the leaf of one and stem and the leaf of the other and put it together or you take the root of one and the leaf of the other put it together and plant it one of them is called a scion and one is called a rooter that becomes a new plant it will have the characteristics of two plants but their genetic pool will be less diverse than of a seed the seed has a maximum diversity in its genetic pool the clonal has halfway house and the and the tissue culture has no genetic oh, diversity okay. so a prudent planter usually does when he plants his seed body or any plant he does he takes 10 does not like to plant more than 10 percent of one variety because if there's anything wrong with it he is only suffering 10 percent that's true wow so definitely being a tea grower for for many generations like your family has come from you have experience to seeing how these plants are are doing adapting um you know you're able to have that time because if it's seven years to find out how this tea plant turns no. out it's a large yeah but this no Jerry, but this is the duty where on tra still this is what the scientists at the tra do they grow it they spend the time they pay to, to spend their time on it and when they're satisfied that the farmer is not going to have a problem then only they release it otherwise they don't just just experiment and tell you that's true and that's that's such a great resource now are other countries reaching out to tra besides in india um asking well, up Ask well, I research results and things no, like that. Do they utilize see, that information? As far as research is concerned, um, there is a small research station in Kenya. There is one small station in Malawi. There is a station in Sri Lanka, but they are minuscule compared to the amount of knowledge and research that has been done at Toklai. Toklai is the oldest and the largest institute today. But I don't like to boast of it because for the last 10, 15 years, we have had to go very slow. Uh, you see, research has become, it was primarily funded by the industry. And when it was funded by industry, it became accountable because industry wants to know where its money is going. But over the years, the government, like all governments, wanted to poke their nose into it. 
and they did this by funding, put increasing funds. So as a fact now, Tokla is dependent on the government for money and government is very, very poor at seeing accountability. So I'm pleased you are not to quote me on this matter, but it's coming to almost a ruin because the government thinks that they are research. They can handle research. Nowhere can government can handle research. Except in NASA, of course. <laughs> and, and so that's, I mean, and there's so many changes too going on at the same time. Like, I feel like with climate change, so many factors, these other departments, are they being greatly affected then? What their research could possibly be noticing right now? Mm, I don't know because problems come up every day. Who would have thought about climate change 20 years ago, right? And even now, the, the problem that you're fearing from climate change may be 10, 20 years away. But we have to start the research now to see what's there. So I, I, I don't think that at any point of time, there'll be all these different areas that have more importance. That could be true, yes. And now, I know Shalini, your sister, told me before that you had many family members who had were, were on the board or had worked with um, uh, TRA. So is that true? Did you have other family members who were part of TRA in the past too, besides you? See, um, that's a difficult question. If you're asking me whether they've been office bearers, then in my family, there have been two members who were also past chairman of TRA, right? But in the in history of TRA, which every three years they get a new chairman, right? So that be that would be uh, in hundred years, maybe thirty chairmen. So a three chairman is only only ten percent. So I don't know how you want to say the importance, but yes, anyone who's in T, T right, and interested should be a member of TRA and the whole industry pays subscription. We all pay, depending on the crop, we pay a subscription to the TRA to fund them. What I was saying to you earlier was that where is that fund used to come entirely from the tea industry, now more than 50% comes from the government who have got no other interest. So really your family from all, you know, your your grandfather and all the people who had split up into different tea plantations and then didn't quite work out and then did their own thing. But essentially your family has been very involved in the tea industry in India and has been very active in understanding and learning and educating to make yes, better yes. and better teas. That That's true. That's why my grandfather who was in Dehradun, my hometown, we are called the Chaiwala family. And yeah. some people call us Mr. Chaiwala, but <laughs> now the prime minister is also a Chaiwala, so I can't say anything. But uh, yes, you're right. We, we, we were the second large, when the British left India, we were the second largest Indian family to own tea gardens. The first, the largest family was Kanois, right? And the second largest was us. Then it came, then came other Indians, but we all split up otherwise uh, it'd be quite different, but it doesn't matter, it happens. Yeah, yeah, that's so amazing. And now there's so many different, like small gardens, large gardens, independent growers. Um, the tea industry has changed a lot in a hundred years or how tea is sold or harvested. I remember I was visiting around Assam and there's people who just grow tea at their house and then they'll take it to like um like a middleman factory and it's a mix of all kinds of people's teas together right you are you are absolutely right uh originally in the british times and not long ago all the gardens all the estates were held by by uh estate owners who had a minimum of four five hundred hectares of tea under them and cultivating them. But over the last 20 years, the small grower, the person who's just growing on one acre or two acres of land has come into being so much so that today, 50% of the production in India is from small growers and only 50% is from the large. So what you're saying, it's happened and I don't see the way that things are going 
the trend will change because mm. cost cost of uh, the the cost of uh, uh, hard, cost of running a tea estate on a large scale is becoming expensively very expensive it's much cheaper for a small grower who has his own labor who's doing his own work because he doesn't have to pay himself so, it's very interesting because in America we have that going on right now, but we call it the gig economy. Like anyone can just start finding some side work and not under necessarily an employer. And so it's like India finds that, you know, small growers can just work for themselves independently and not have as much overhead as the larger estates. And in America, mm -hmm. some people are finding the same way with their jobs that you know they can work when they want to work and do what mm. they want to do and not have the overhead or have to have the strict regulations of working under an employer or owning a company yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right i think that's a movement of even a child even baby out she says half the persons who own tea shops are actually now employed but have now become self-employed and finding their own business it's happening with the trend of the times. But, uh, but tell me, Jenny, I'll ask you a reverse question. You see, in America, what happened for farming? Firstly, originally in Kansas and the Midwest, all the farms were owned by small farmers, not very large farmers. But over the years with mechanization, we find that big companies are owning huge tracts of farms and the middle farmers have been thrown out is that right so the smaller farmers have been what was the question again i'm saying that that originally the farms in usa in midwest that i read the history of they were farmers who won't say 200 acres 300 acres right and yes. it, was, it was a farm farmer was running his own farm and over the years, because of depressions, prices of food went down, the farmer had to sell his land, and it went to big companies who had these threshers and big machines. Up now, the entire farming in the USA is held by big corporates, not yeah. by small farmers. Mm -hmm. So why is it right? So I'm just asking this question because it's the reverse happening in India. You're having yeah. big corporates. Yeah. Well, and I, I think a lot of political things in America right now with the big farmers uh, or the big corporations who own a bunch of the small farms, now there's kind of a movement for mm -hmm. smaller growers and people wanting to know exactly where their food comes from. And people, the, the trend right now for those who can afford um, more expensive produce will go and find the original source of that and go and support the smaller growers, the smaller mm -hmm. farms, the family run mm -hmm. farms, because they mm -hmm. want to not support the big conglomerate corporations. So mm -hmm. you see a divide of those people who can afford it will mm -hmm. go and spend more money on produce that is for smaller farms um and then those who don't have as much income will just buy whatever's available at a cheaper price and um i feel like that's the same thing too with um not necessarily the same way of looking at it for india but like speciality teas or like yeah. you know amazing teas that you'll see people from around the world looking for less of a commodity tea because those who can afford it want something specialized from whether mm -hmm. it's Columbia or Glenburn, right? And we want these speciality teas because we can afford it. We don't want the regular commodity tea like the majority of the world is drinking um, because we could just drink you know, tea all day long. But if we're going to have a special moment, have a special tea time, make it special for us or in Western countries, I feel mm -hmm. like more people are becoming educated and understanding are willing to support those tea growers or those tea estates like yours because we want to know the story and we want to know what makes that lot or batch special mm -hmm. right. and i think the smaller growers they're not necessarily there yet in india because it's just a hodgepodge like a mixture of everything for. No, I, I'll, I'll tell you why the small growers cannot be 
bought specialties because the small grower, none of the small growers has enough leaf to support a factory. It's true. <laughs> Unless, right? Yes. So they sell the leaf to factories and a bo- it's called a bought leaf factory, B-L-F, bought leaf factory. And the bought leaf factory gets its material from 10 different growers, right? So it becomes a hodgepodge, just as you say. Today, the only ones who can make a specialty tea are people like us who have got the know-how, we've got the knowledge. But the point is that you may like to have the specialty, but the Americans don't want to pay. The problem happens not at the American consumer level, it is the American importers. For I, I went and attended a, a, a tea convention in Colorado a few years ago, and I saw some statistics and saw that where is the price of tea that was imported had increased only 8% over a decade. The price of tea at the consumer level had gone over by over 100%. <laughs> so what is happening in the tea industry is that the, 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 the bulk of the money, the profits, the surplus is not going to the grower, right? It is not, it is going not even to the middleman who is importing the tea. It's basically going to the person who are marketing the tea to the consumer. He is making a whopping profit and that is probably true of all commodities because we have no control on the price at which he will sell. And as a result of this, today tea, I know for tea, it was sure, we are on a crisis. We just simply, the people tell us, our workers tell us, we want this facility, we want that facility, you should pay us more, 100% we agree. We want to increase the wages, but it has to be based on a capacity to pay. We can only pay as much as we earn. We cannot do more than that. And this is the crisis where we have, we call them all the hypocrites. They want to sit on top and say, you should do this, and you should do this, and you're not doing this, and you're exploiting the workers and doing this, but they won't, the money they're not going to pay, money they want to ha- have all for themselves. So, Jenny, this is a big crisis. Tea, is, tea in India is today in a very critical situation because its capacity to pay is not there. That's all. There's no problem. I would like to, in my gardens, I like to double the wages. There's no reason why I shouldn't. They deserve it, but where's the money? I get That's it. True. I can only get it from the consumer, unless the co- consumer is paying, mind you. If the consu- if I could sell the tea directly to the consumer like Charlie does, I would be in heaven. I yeah. would have more than enough money. And right? I'm glad that you have Shalini reaching out to people, you know, like yeah. me, and meeting people and saying, "How can we get this direct from farm to to the consumer?" Yeah, that, yeah. it makes a big difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm especially like the quality of life, because I've seen the people, you know, pretty happy there and like wearing really nice clothes, picking tea every day. You know, to me, it's like very, very flashy (laughs) clothes and very bright and they look happy. But, you know, life could be better if if people knew that there's this issue with the transition into getting the, the tea into the final consumer's hands that somewhere in there there's a stop, you know, something is, you know, not allowing the money to flow all the way to. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I I do have a question though. How much tea can be produced on an acre of land or not an acre, like let's say a hectare. I know you guys measure. No, no, I'm I'm quite comfortable with an acre. An acre is 43,000 square feet. And if you want, one bush can grow in about two square feet. You calculate. The, anyway, to answer your question, in one acre of land, it depends where you're growing it. If in Assam, in one day, one hectare, as you say, one acre would be about 2,200 pounds of tea. Wow. That is 1,000 kgs per acre. Of dry leaves and, or fresh leaves? Oh, this is made tea, made, tea made. Okay. Uh, it's not green leaf. Uh, to get it into green leaf, you multiply it by 4.5. So, so, so if I said the figure, pardon me? Oh, so yeah. that's a lot of bags of tea. Yeah, but, but in, in, in a place like Darjeeling or Nilgiris, it would be maybe, one, 20, maybe 25% of that. Because it's a high elevation, 
climate is not so salubrious, it doesn't grow so well. That's it, but it grows better. Now, the thing is, uh, there's one philosophy, notwithstanding whatever I said about organic tea. I believe that anything that grows slowly grows best. So organic tea grows much slower than inorganic tea. That's a fact. So maybe you are maybe you are having a tasty tea. I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm saying both things at the same time. But uh, yes, anything that is growing slowly that you're not forcing it to grow fast should be a better better cup or a better plant and a better human being also. <laughs> Well, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for the Essence of Tea podcast.